Today uh, we will talk about the Arctic char, uh, Salvelinus alpinus, which is the uh, Latin name. And um, uh, I will tell you about all the adaptations that this uh, fish uh, uh, have to, uh, to be able to survive in the harsh uh, environment. It's the most northernmost it's the northernmost uh, living freshwater fish in the world. It has been found at uh, approximately 80 degrees north. And uh, <clears throat> if we look at the... Um, uh, next slide, we can see the distribution of the Arctic char. Um, it's an anadromous species, meaning that it can migrate to the sea and change between two very different environments, uh, fresh water and salt water. And uh, all the uh, populations are marked here in blue, which is a uh, char that does necessarily uh, migrate to the sea, either because they don't have uh, the chance to do that, uh, no rivers, or uh, they uh, choose not to. Uh, the red uh, areas uh, are uh, uh, marked as where the uh, Arctic char that can migrate and does and do migrate to the sea uh, lives. Uh, as you might see, uh, interesting for you, there are Arctic char in the uh, middle of, uh, some of you maybe, in the middle of, uh, of Europe, in the Alpine areas. And that's probably char that has been trapped there and uh, still survives there and, and thrive also in the inland of, of Russia. Okay. Uh, the Ar Arctic char is distributed circumpolarly as, as shown at high latitudes uh, and at high latitudes further south. It's well adapted to low water temperatures and changing seasons. Actually, it prefers low water uh, temperatures and uh, it will always seek cold rivers when it lives in, uh, in, uh, in a lake. Um, it is an opportunistic species with many adaptations to life at the edge. If you look at uh, a typical year of the Arctic char, uh, we can start in the in the lake. <coughs> this is shown. Uh, uh, this shows ice that uh, in uh, a northern uh, Arctic lake will be uh, covered by ice in the, during the winter months, and um, uh, when the spring comes at um, yeah, April, May, uh, the ice starts to uh, disappear. And this is, uh, of course, a little bit dependent on where this lake is situated, how high it's on in the mountain or uh, at uh, uh, what uh, latitude. Um, and then they will uh, um, uh, start to wake up from their uh, winter hibernation. I will come back to that and they will uh, start to increase their appetite because their appetite is very low during the winter. They uh, don't eat at all and they just survive on the uh, fat and uh, uh, that they have stored in their bodies before the winter. Uh, then some of these uh, fish will, uh, after uh, um, some uh, weeks and months, they will migrate to the sea. Uh, they will do that, this when they are approximately five to seven years. So if they are uh, hatched uh, from the egg, they will stay in the lake for approximately five to seven years before some of them uh, chooses to go to uh, the sea. Not all of them uh, do this. Uh, we don't know why, but some of the Arctic char choose to stay in the lake uh, all their life and uh, therefore they grow very slowly because what is important here is that the amount of food in the lake, in a freshwater lake, is much less uh, than in the sea. But the nice thing about staying in the freshwater is that the amount of predators that wants to eat you is not many. So it's uh, more easy to survive regarding predators in a freshwater lake, but it's more difficult to survive regarding the amount of food that you have available. Uh, so <clears throat> if you take one of these uh, chars that migrate, they are now a freshwater fish and they are going to 
go to the sea and become a saltwater fish. Uh, I will come uh, back to that in a sh uh, short uh, moment. Uh, but anyway, they migrate through the river and come out in the sea or a fjord. And here they have a lot of food available. They stay there for approximately 40 days and they go out there in June, July. Again, dependent on where the lake is situated. If the lake is situated at Svalbard, for instance, they will not um, enter the sea until the ice in the river uh, is gone, and that will be maybe the end of July. But if the lake is situated in uh, Tromsø, which is at uh, 69 degrees north, then um, they will might, uh, probably go out in June. So, when they are in the sea, they eat uh, all the time. Uh, and they uh, get much more fat uh, deposited under the skin than they would have uh, done if they stayed in the lake. Uh, the problem uh, in the sea, of course, is that uh, bigger fish and the sea mammals, uh, marine mammals, will eat you. So it's uh, about eating as much as you can uh, during uh, as short time as possible. And when you have gained enough fat, for the rest of the year, you migrate back to the lake where the amount of predators are uh, much uh, uh, less. So, <clears throat> but some of these, we don't know why, uh, Char uh, chooses to stay in the lake and uh, it will take maybe 10 years for them to reach sizes of two to uh, three, four kilos. But uh, if you choose to migrate to the sea, you can uh, reach the weight of two to three kilos after only yeah, two years of migrating. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at uh, fish, as you all know, uh, fish have uh, gills. And uh, the sole purpose of the gills is, of course, to give the uh, fish oxygen. Uh, but also to so that the fish can get rid of the carbon dioxide produced in the metabolism. Uh, the gills uh, function in a way that the water uh, flows over the gill uh, arches and the gill filaments. And if we look at the uh, close-up of uh, gill filament, uh, it has uh, blood coming in and blood coming out. And this is a countercurrent. Uh, 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 this is a countercurrent uh, flow that the uh, uh, oxygen, no, the, the blood, which is low in oxygen, uh, flows in the opposite direction of the water, which is rich uh, in oxygen, and uh, the um, uh, blood is oxygenated and uh, leaves the gills uh, fresh with oxygen and enters the body to, su uh, to supply the cells. Of course, when you are a fish and you uh, have gills and uh, get your oxygen in this way, it's impossible to be homeotherm, which is uh, 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 stable uh, body temperature. Uh, as we humans, we have 37 degrees, and mammals have more or less 37 degrees, birds have 39 degrees. But when you uh, uh, take your, and we have lungs, we, we breathe air, but uh, fish um, getting oxygen this way, uh, they have the exact same uh, uh, body temperature as uh, the water surrounding it. Uh, because the water is flowing over the gills and are in contact with the blood all the time. So it's impossible to, um, to have any other uh, water temperature than, no, yeah, body temperature than the water temperature. So that is the reason for fish uh, being uh, heterothermic. Uh, if you look at the tuna, um, uh, the tuna fish, you have uh, eaten tuna fish, all of you, I guess, and uh, the tuna fish meat has another consistence, consistence than um, uh, regular fish meat, uh, more meat-like. The reason for this is that the tuna fish swims at uh, extreme speeds and is moving all the time. Uh, uh, the water flows over the gills by they opening their mouth while swimming, and that's how the water just passes the gills. Uh, 
so the temperature in the muscle of a tuna fish can be almost 35 degrees uh, because of the friction heat uh, uh, produced when they swim. And since they swim at so high speeds and so uh, and swim all the time, um, the temperature is much closer to mammal, mammalian, uh, mammalian temperatures than fish temperatures, almost 35 degrees. That is why the uh, tuna meat um, tastes different, uh, differently than ordinary fish meat. Okay, <clears throat> so now look, let's look at how is it possible to be a freshwater fish and then become a saltwater fish uh, within the same species. Let's first look at uh, the um, um, challenges for a freshwater fish. First of all, I would have to explain the uh, term osmolarity. Osmolarity is only, a, a, um, well, it, it it's, um, more or less means the concentrations of salts and molecules in a fluid. And in um, salt water, this number is set to a thousand. Inside biological systems, uh, also humans, but also fish, all biological systems, the osmolarity is approximately 330. And to, be, to make it simple, let's say it's 330 salt molecules per liter of water or fluid. In salt uh, water, you have 1,000. In fresh water, it's 50. So uh, Arctic char living in uh, freshwater uh, systems have uh, more salt inside its body than the water surrounding it. So the problem for this fish is that water will enter the fish. You look at the uh, blue arrows here, here. The water will enter the fish uh, through the skin and through the gills uh, because there is more salt inside the fish than outside. At the same time, it will lose some uh, salt and ions through the skins, uh, and also uh, through the skin, uh, but also through the urine. So the problem for the freshwater fish it, is that it's getting hydrated, it's getting diluted, uh, it's getting more fresh water in, than, uh, so it's, it's in a danger of getting a less concentration of salt than its cells are built to handle. So to um, be able to cope with this, uh, the uh, freshwater fish actively takes up ions through the gills. It has uh, uh, salt pumps on the gills that actively uh, uses energy to pump salt from the freshwater and into the uh, fish uh, to uh, prevent uh, getting diluted. Um, at the same time, it drinks no or very, very little water, and the urine is very diluted. So the fish needs to get rid of a lot of fresh water, so it's very diluted. Uh, the salt uh, water fish is, uh, has the exact opposite problem. Uh, around, surrounding the fish, you have almost like a desert. It's much less water, fresh water in the salt water than inside the fish. So the fish, uh, uh, gets a lot of ions and salts into the body through the gills and the skin, and uh, uh, it loses water through the skin and through the gills. So it's in the danger of getting dehydrated. Uh, <coughs> the fish solves this by drinking a lot of water and actively pumping salts and ions out through the gills. Also, the urine is very concentrated with uh, salts and ions and uh, very little water is leaving the fish, the saltwater fish, through the urine. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, some uh, uh, ions can move in through the, uh, into the fish through the skin. So, this slide uh, just sums up that a freshwater fish and a saltwater fish has opposite challenges. The freshwater fish has a problem of getting dehydrated and the saltwater fish has a problem of getting dehydrated. So the Arctic char that will move from freshwater systems to saltwater systems has to change all of these adaptations 
uh, to be able to uh, to to migrate. Uh, and uh, also, this takes uh, maybe uh, one to two weeks, uh, and uh, the fish will come down the river, still fresh water, and enter the um, first part of the uh, sea. And there you have brackish water. You have a, a mix of salt water and fresh water. And the fish will just move slowly within one week uh, from uh, pure salt, uh, fresh water to pure salt water. And what it does is that it becomes a salt water fish. It will start drinking water. The pumps on the gills will uh, change di uh, the, their uh, direction from pumping ions in in fresh water to pumping ions out in salt water. Also, the fish will start to produce very concentrated urine. When this is done, uh, the fish is now a saltwater fish and can enter the salt water, the, uh, the sea, and uh, survive. Uh, the problem when you're living in um, in the high north is that, of course, the lake during winter is covered with uh, ice uh, and also covered with uh, snow. So you don't know. Uh, it's very important to time uh, uh, when you are leaving uh, the uh, lake and go to the sea because this is uh, risky and you also want to time this with uh, getting enough food in the salt water. Uh, so uh, to be able to do that when you live in the high north, you cannot trust uh, snow or ice because in Tromsø, for instance, uh, it can snow, it has been snowing and it can snow during June and it's the summer. So if you're using uh, snow or uh, ice as a cue to what the time of year it is, you can be fooled. The only thing that you can be 100% uh, sure of telling you the exact right time of year is the amount of light, uh, hours of light during one day. In the summer in the north, it's 24 hours uh, sunlight. Uh, and in the winter, uh, mid middle winter, December, it's uh, maybe one hour of uh, dim light. So to be able to measure the amount of uh, light hours in a day, uh, increasing uh, through the spring and uh, closing to the summer, the uh, Arctic char has, uh, and a lot of other fishes of course, has uh, a gland called pineal gland, which is shown here in, uh, in uh, red. This is the head of the Arctic char. The ice is uh, here and the, uh, the other eye is here. And we are just cut off the skin on top of the skull. And this uh, pineal gland, which is red, full of blood, is uh, lying uh, like in a window. Uh, the uh, skull is, uh, the, the calcification of the skull is, uh, you can see through, uh, through this, uh, in this area. So the calcification is less exactly upon uh, the pineal gland. Uh, <clears throat> this is how it looks. So here is the pineal gland. It measures the amount of um, uh, light hours to the day by its production of a hormone you might have heard of, melatonin. Uh, <clears throat> the chemical reaction of producing melatonin is that it's made uh, through two steps. Uh, from uh, a molecule called serotonin. And serotonin is uh, uh, the substance which is used in the happy, pe uh, happy pills <laughs> for uh, uh, depressed people. Uh, depressed people get pills with serotonin uh, because it makes them happy. And some researchers think that this uh, might uh, explain uh, the um, uh, cause of winter depression. Uh, because during winter you have no light uh, or less light and then the m production of melatonin will be high. Therefore, the production of serotonin will be low in this period. So, <clears throat> when light hits the pineal gland, it inhibits this enzyme which produces uh, N-acetyl serotonin from serotonin, the first step in the production of melatonin. So it inhibits this. So when it's light, 
you have no production of melatonin. Uh, during darkness, this inhibition is uh, taken away and uh, the uh, chemical reaction goes over to the right and melatonin is produced and serotonin is decreased. So when it's darkness, you have from the pine gland a production of melatonin, which is increasing, but also you have nerve signals coming from the pineal gland because it's situated in the brain, which we don't know exactly what these nerve signals do and ex exactly where they end up, but they do something uh, to prepare or tell the fish that now it's dark and the more melatonin you have in your blood, it's a hormone, tells you that you are uh, in winter. When light is coming back, and more and more and the production of melatonin goes down and uh, in the end uh, goes away, it will tell you that now it's summer. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, slide uh, figure shows you the production of melatonin in the pine gland of the arctic char. Uh, you have the concentration of melatonin on the y-axis in picograms per milliliter of blood and uh, on the x-axis uh, the dark uh, bars indicate darkness and the white bars indicate light. So you can see that uh, the uh, uh, concentration of melatonin is low during light but when you put on darkness it increases immediately and stays high until you put on the light again goes down. So this uh, top, top panel can show you the situation uh, during winter in the arctic char and this lower panel shows you the situation during summer when you have uh, or yeah you have some periods of darkness here so maybe the autumn so this is the signal that tells not only the arctic char but uh, all arctic mammals what time of year you are uh, that is coming up and this can tell the char when it should start to migrate to the sea so uh, <clears throat> Uh, to do this uh, sampling, this is, uh, shows you a picture from uh, the blood sampling of the Arctic char that we uh, uh, catched on the ice. This is ice on, an, on a lake uh, outside of Tromsø. And to keep the char uh, from freezing, we had a heated tent. Uh, we catched the char in holes outside here and, uh, and took them in here, anesthetized them in uh, water with uh, anesthesia. And then we took uh, blood samples, and then we just put them ba uh, back in fresh water, and they wake up in uh, yeah two three minutes, and then we put them back in the uh, in the lake. Uh, these two pictures is just to show you the same lake during the winter months, and in this uh, period the Arctic char is overwintering under uh, the ice laying very very still without moving to save all the energy uh, that they can. During summer when the ice is uh, disappeared uh, some of this arctic char will be here but some of them will go out the river down here to the sea and the fjord which you see here and uh, and get fat. Uh, this is a, just a small film to show you uh, uh, fishing uh, um, some fishing of the Arctic char. Uh, this uh, Arctic char comes uh, from the river to the right here into the bigger lake here and then it moves directly into this uh, uh, little pond because here you have a cold uh, river coming down from the mountain and since the Arctic char uh, prefers cold water it will always be found around uh, cold uh, rivers uh, entering lakes. So you know exactly where to fish it. Uh, we we'll start this movie, <clears throat> and uh, this um, uh, lake here is approximately eight nine meters deep. And when you fish this Arctic char, uh, because this is in the first of July, so the Arctic char has just arrived uh, from uh, the sea. So when you fish this, you sh and I'm uh, uh, fishing with a uh, with a fly now, fly fishing. You should um, use um, uh, should use uh, flies that resembles uh, organisms in the sea because they are still eating uh, they still uh, want to eat uh, sea uh, sea animals 
And you can also see that this char has just arrived from the um, uh, from the sea because it's very uh, silver colored. It will get darker uh, during the winter. It's a very, very good fish to eat. This is just uh, 20 minutes uh, drive from the uh, city of Tromsø, and then you are uh, on your own, uh, can be fishing, and uh, this is uh, exactly one kilo, this Arctic jar. Yeah, don't need to, to listen to more to that. So, <clears throat> the... Uh, uh, life strategy of the anadromous uh, arctic char. Most of the annual feed intake takes place during the short uh, summer in the seawater residence, and this uh, will give the uh, arctic char pronounced seasonal variation in growth and adiposity. That means uh, fat status. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, so if you look at um, uh, the months uh, on this figure, you have the months on the x-axis, May, September, January, through two seasons, and you have the weight in grams here, males, females. When uh, the Arctic char enters the sea saltwater for the first time, it weighs approximately 300 grams, and it puts on 300 grams it, uh, during just uh, three weeks, four weeks. Then, during the winter, it depends on this fat and uh, have a metabolic depression, meaning that it stays completely still and saves all the energy it can. So the uh, body weight doesn't decrease that much during the winter, only from uh, a little bit above 600 grams to a little bit above under 600 grams. Then next season, uh, a new uh, uh, migration to the sea and now it increases its weight from approximately 600 grams to 900 grams. Uh, so during only uh, two seasons, uh, it increases from 300 to 900 grams. <clears throat> so body weight, body weight. Five, yeah. Uh, so and here you can see a picture of uh, Arctic char before the seawater residence and after the seawater residence. So the char is getting very fat in the sea. Uh, this is a very interesting study where we had uh, some uh, activity loggers that we attached to the fin of the Arctic char just to see how little uh, it did move during the winter. And uh, this logger uh, logged the activity through the winter and we recaptured it when it was uh, entering uh, the um, when it was entering the sea. And you can see the uh, depth it's staying on. It's approximately seven meters and it stays completely still. Uh, the water temperature is uh, a little bit up, uh, uh, below one degree Celsius. And you could wonder if it was alive. But this shows you that in a very small uh, period, it moved from seven meters to a little bit above six meters, so it was alive. So uh, um, um, besides that, it was completely still in the water to save energy. So the seasonality of the Arctic char, uh, uh, winter, energy saving, low activity, low appetite, uh, amassification, uh, spring, Transition period in which the fish resume its appetite, develop seawater tolerance and migratory behavior. It's called multiplication. Summer, seawater residence, high appetite and growth and uh, deposition of fat. And autumn preparation for overwintering and also, I forgot to mention, reproduce uh, reproduction. And then the appetite is turned off again. So it's very seasonal. This picture shows you uh, Lake Arkvatten at Svalbard, which is eight, at 80 degrees north in August. And as I told you, uh, 
uh, depending on where the lake is situated, will uh, will decide when the Arctic char can leave uh, the lake for the for the sea down here. And in this case, it cannot leave the lake until August because uh, it's first in August that the ice in the river uh, is uh, gone, so that it's actually possible to move uh, to the sea and get fat. So uh, that was uh, what I was going to tell you about. So uh, I hope that you learned something and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>